Think back to the first time that you moved away from your parents' house. What were you feeling? Excited? Scared? I mean, I'm sure it was a whole host of feelings, but as long as you left willingly, I'm sure that one of those things was that you had this greater sense of freedom, that your, that your whole world just opened up and now you have the opportunity to learn those life skills. It's really, it's a monumental time in all of our lives, but unfortunately across the United States, people with disabilities are facing a severe housing crisis that's keeping them from being able to experience these emotions. Now in this video, we're gonna be talking about some of the um, issues that people with disabilities are facing when it comes to housing. And, and then we'll talk about some steps that we can start taking in order to tackle these issues. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and for all the best information on special needs planning, make sure that you hit that subscribe button and that notification bell to make sure that you're alerted every time that I post new videos. So the first issue is that many people with intellectual or development, developmental disabilities live with aging caregivers. The studies show that, up to, that there's probably one million people with these intellectual or developmental disabilities that are living with a caregiver who is 60 years of age or older. And unfortunately, a lot of these people don't have a plan for when that caregiver is no longer able to take care of them. Now, there are many factors that keep families from planning for the future. One of the misconceptions is that planning is really only for the wealthy. But we know from previous videos that it only takes a very small amount of money left to a person with a disability who relies on benefits to um, eliminate their eligibility for those benefits. It's so important that aged caregivers are supported and encouraged to plan for the future so that when something happens to them, they don't have to worry about what's going to happen to their children or their siblings that they're taking care of. So another issue that they face is the affordability of housing. Now, uh, often a one bedroom apartment is more money than a person is receiving on their monthly um, uh, SSI check. This could lead to homelessness, homelessness having to live in institutions, um, having to live in a nursing home or having to choose to live somewhere that is unsafe or unclean. Now, even if the apartment, even if they can afford it with their monthly SSI check, often it's more than half of what their check is, which means that they are one financial emergency away from the possibility of being evicted. Now, fortunately, there are some, there are things called um, the housing choice vouchers that provide a person who has a disability with clean, safe, and decent housing in the private market. Now, if eligible, the participant is able to choose any housing that meets the requirements of the program. They're not forced to go live in subsidized housing projects. Now, to, to be eligible, they, they look at your annual income, your family size, and then whether or not you're a U.S. citizen or have a um, approved immigration status for this program. Now, generally, the family's income cannot be any more than 50% of the median median income of the county that they choose to live. But more often than not, it is the people that actually are chosen for this program, uh, their income is actually less than 30% of the median income of the county which they choose to live in. Now, um, the demand for these vouchers actually are, it's usually much higher than the vouchers themselves. So normally there are very long waiting periods uh, in order to get one. So as we know from previous videos, um, a lot of people choose to fund a special needs trust to enhance their loved one's quality of life. So it's really important to know that when somebody is um, granted one of these vouchers, they have to pay 30% of their income um, for that rent. This means that if they are regular, regularly receiving income and principal from the trust, it's gonna be counted as income, so they have to actually pay out more for the rent. But if the um, payments from the trust are more sporadic, then that's not gonna be counted as income and um, it's not going to increase the amount of money that they have to pay towards the rent. So now that we're on the topic of special needs trust, I wanna remind you that yes, a special needs trust can pay for uh, food and shelter, but you may not want it to. Remember that SSI is designed to pay for the basic needs of a person with a disability. So any money that's coming out of the trust to pay for food or shelter is gonna be counted as income, which could reduce the amount of money that that person is receiving on their SSI check. So we know from previous videos that if a person relies on their monthly SSI check, they need to have very limited income and resources per month. 
Now, this does not mean that we should never pay for food or shelter out of a out of a trust. Sometimes it is appropriate. Sometimes it, the best thing would be to to um, accept the reduction of the SSI benefit to pay for a, um, a nice, clean, safe home for the individual. I hope that you found this information to be helpful. And while, yes, there are some general basics when it comes to special needs planning, it's really important that you speak to somebody who has specialized knowledge in the area of special needs planning for your individual approach. Now, if you liked what you heard today, make sure that you hit that subscribe button and that notification bell to make sure that you're alerted every time that I post new videos and please share it with a friend. Also, if you really liked what you heard today, make sure that you click on that link below to become a client so we can start coordinating your overarching financial strategy with your special needs plan. Thank you for watching and remember, planning for your loved one's future today makes for a confident tomorrow.